Um, thank you for joining this webinar today. Um, it's on the redneck longhorn beetle and the brown spruce longhorn beetle as well. Um, in the office, we've got Lucy, myself, and we've also got Dave Williams, who's an experienced entomologist, and um, who you can direct any questions to at the end of the presentation if you have any. Um, now, this, this uh, webinar was going to be delivered by um, Simon, um, but he was unable to be here today, so we've had to pre-record it. So, so we'll start. Hello. So today we're going to talk about the red-necked longhorn beetle, Baromia bungee, and the brown spruce longhorn, Tetrogreen buscan. So I'm Simon Morath at Forest Research. Okay, so the talk structure, um, taking each beetle individually, we'll talk about what the beetle is, um, its host, so the tree species that it will attack, uh, any outbreak information. Then we'll move on to the life cycle and talk about symptoms and how to identify the insect and indeed the damage that it causes. Then to talk about various pathways and movements of spread uh, and protective measures. And then moving on lastly to cover similar damage types that can be confused Okay, so starting with the red necked longhorn beetle, Aroma, Aromia bungee. It's a longhorn beetle and wood boring tree pest. It's not in the UK as far as we know. It originates from Asia and it's in the same family as Asian longhorn beetle, which I believe you have already covered. Um, so it has a very similar life cycle to Asian longhorn beetle uh, and the larvae develop in the wood of the tree and indeed this is where the damage occurs. Okay, so the host range, um, the beetle can survive in forest environments, urban areas and orchards, and its tree species of choice are the prunus species, which are the fruit trees, apricot, cherry, plum, and peach. Uh, there have been unofficial records on Poplus, Quercus, and Salix, uh, which need to be validated. So Prunus and Poplus are widespread in the UK. 5% uh, of urban tree cover in England is Prunus, and approximately 900 hectares of commercial plum planting a year occurs in the UK. So we do have the host tree species in the UK, um, and not the beetle yet, but we obviously it's not something that we want either. The economic impact of the red necked longhorn is really only known in China on cultivated apricot, peach, and plum. We know it's a very destructive pest, and rather importantly, it can infest young and healthy trees. A uh, recent outbreak in Italy, um, the red necked longhorn was killing 20 to 30 year old plum trees, uh, as well as apricot, cherry, and peach trees, in about three to four years. There's two outbreaks currently in Italy and one in Germany that are all under eradication. In the UK, it has been intercepted only once, as far as we know, and that was in 2010. And it was actually found, uh, an adult beetle was found between wooden pallets in a warehouse. So showing you the, uh, the risk of wood packaging material. It's also been intercepted uh, in, in America in 2008. The life cycle of the redneck longhorn is typically two to four years. Uh, this will depend on latitude and climate. And the flight period is normally March to August. The life cycle is very similar to that of other, of other longhorns and indeed Asian longhorn beetle. So eggs are laid in bark crevices or bark cracks, typically one to six eggs per site picture on the right there shows you uh, two eggs, uh, five to six millimeters in length, and the eggs are laid normally in the first 30 centimeters of the trunk above soil level, um, but it can occur in larger branches if the tree is sufficient of sufficient size. 
typically they would hatch within 10 days and the larva will tunnel into the bark. The larvae will bore galleries under the bark in sapwood and in the heartwood. And this is where fatal damage is, is often caused. They eject fresh regularly, uh, at least once a day. The picture on the right there is of uh, Prunus tree species in Italy. It's not a great picture, but you can even see the orange frass quite clearly. So it's quite conspicuous, uh, this, this, uh, this diagnostic. Uh, so frass is actually the material that the larvae produce whilst tunneling and processing wood material as they develop and go through their instars. This slide shows you the larva of the red net longhorn. So it's very typical of the serum bison. Uh, and they're very difficult to distinguish uh, in larval stage. These pictures are from the EPO uh, global database, so the European Plant Protection Organization. Uh, there's a link there in the top right, which is probably worth a look. It's quite a useful site. This picture shows some of the damage in the cambium layer, uh, some of the tunneling. And in particular, it also shows you the sort of fine granular frass material that is always produced. This picture shows you the larva, uh, various sizes, so we call that instars, and indeed some of the frass. Now, the larva can overwinter any of these stages, so the smaller, younger instars can overwinter, as can the larger, latter instars. And indeed, if con conditions become unfavorable, the temperature drops too much, they, they just take longer to develop, but they, they normally still will complete their life cycle. Mature larvae are about 38 to 50 millimeters long. This photograph shows frass once again, and it's quite conspicuous at the base of the tree. And the picture on the left there shows some of the galleries and tunneling and frass generated beneath the bark. The picture on the right is a smaller tree species, uh, probably Prunus, and it, goes sh it just shows you that the damage is at the base of the tree, as, as, that, as the beetle does require quite a large girth on the, bark, on the timber itself. So smaller trees will have damage on the lower parts of the stem. The galleries, typically 50 to 60 centimeters long. The pupation of the beetle occurs in the heartwood of the tree. And the trees will die from the top down as they become increasingly girdled. Now, Late instar larvae, so the larger larvae and pupae, can survive for quite a few months in logs, in cut, in cut logs, and still complete their life cycle with successful adult emergence. The exit holes are oval and between 6 to 10 millimeters by 10 to 16 millimeters. So you may remember this is unlike Asian longhorn beetle where the exit holes are uh, spherical or circular. The adults uh, are around during the daytime. They measure t between 23 and 37 millimeters. And they have, as you can see in the picture, black shiny wing cases and a very distinctive red neck plate. They typically, typically can survive for uh, between 47 and 54 days. During artificial conditions, females have been shown to lay anywhere between 34 and 734 eggs. Okay, so the pathways for movement are quite typical of other longhorn beetle species, including Asian longhorn beetle. So the redneck longhorn can travel in wood packaging material with lava or pupa, and this is the number one risk, or the highest risk. Uh, wood or wooden products of prunus species, as long as they are of sufficient size. Uh, 
plants for planting and bonsais pose a risk of moving eggs and young larva to new locations. And it's possible that adult beetles can hitchhike in imported goods, although the risk of this is thought to be very occasional. Adult flight distance is actually unknown, but it's thought to be similar to the flight distance of Asian longhorn beetle, which is an average of 560 meters and a maximum of two and a half kilometers. Although, because the red net longhorn beetle is oligophagous, meaning it has a, a more specific tree host range, i.e. the prunus species, compared to Asian longhorn beetle, which has and can feed on quite a large number of tree species, it's thought that the red net longhorn beetle may well have to travel further in order to find the right type of host, and it may indeed spread quicker. So regarding protective measures, in 2014, the red net longhorn beetle was added to the EPO, A1 list of pests for regulation. So EPO stands for the European Plant Protection Organization. Uh, and as such, EPO countries were advised to regulate as a, uh, the red neck longhorn as a quarantine pest. For example, uh, and regarding plant for planting, particularly prunus, they must originate from pest-free areas or grown under insect-proof conditions. Uh, prunus wood commodities, again, must be from pest-free areas or heat-treated, irradiated, or chipped. Wood packaging material should always be treated to ISPM 15. That just stands for International Standards for Phytosanitary Measures. There is a link there at the bottom if anyone wants to explore more about that. Currently, research is being conducted to see if eggs and young larva can develop and complete life cycle in cut logs. We know that latter in stars and pupae can complete the life cycle or finish the life cycle, but not as yet, not, um, we do not know if the young larva or eggs can develop on cut logs. So regarding similar types of damage, we have in the UK goat moth, Cossus cossus, and that will typically only be found on dead and dying trees rather than on healthy trees. The larva is quite a lot larger. It's up to 10 centimeters, sorry, 10, 10 centimeters, <clears throat> and is indeed a dark red color with brown black plates rather than the sort of pale creamy yellow color of redneck longhorn beetle. But quite importantly, they leave circular exit holes of about 10 millimeters. The leopard moth is also present in the UK and, and can cause similar damage to the redneck longhorn. The pictures in this slide are on sycamore and alder, but it, it can go on to prunus as well. Now the larva are similar size to the redneck longhorn, up to 55 millimeters, but they preferentially bore into the side branches rather than the main stem, and are usually found in branches less than 10 centimeters across, which you wouldn't normally find the redneck longhorn beetle uh, utilizing that type of material. Again, they, they leave circular exit holes of about 10 millimeters, and not oval, and the larva is also quite distinctly different. So regarding top-down crown dieback that can occur with the red net longhorn, there are obviously root pathogens, which you are aware of, that can do the same thing. So Phytophthora, for example, uh, there you'd have to look for the distinctive bleeding of the lower part of the stem. And also honey fungus, uh, another root pathogen, Armillaria, and distinctive features of the white mycelial fan, also stem bleeding at the base of the stem. And also, at the right time of year, you'll also see the fruiting bodies. Of course, abiotic influences can damage roots, mechanical damage, 
uh, or root compaction, and that will all lead to crown dieback. So these are all things to bear in mind when you're looking for causes of tree decline. So a quick summary slide then about the redneck longhorn. It is a destructive longhorn beetle pest, primarily of fruit trees. It originates from Asia, uh, and it's been introduced into Italy and Germany. The larval stage is the destructive stage, which uh, kills the trees by girdling, and indeed it has a very similar life cycle to Asian longhorn beetle. And also, similar to Asian longhorn beetle, the redneck longhorn can attack healthy and stress trees. The exit holes are oval, and you will see evidence of frass, quite a lot of frass in infested trees. The adults have a distinctive red neck, and there are guidelines in place already uh, from the European Plant Protection Organization. Okay. Has, um, does anybody have any questions for Dave before we move on to the green spruce longhorn beetle? I just have one. Um, the frass you showed was very red. Is that a function of the um, tree rather than the beetle itself? The what is red? The, the, the frass that the beetle produces, it seemed to be very red in those photos. Is that a little bit like ulnus species? It just comes out that colour and that's a factor of the prunus species rather than um, any particular factor that relates to the beetle. Yeah, that's almost certainly down to the species of tree that, it's, uh, that the beetle's feeding on, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. Nope. Right, right, I've got a question I'd like to ask Dave. Um, I was just wondering, how long would the life cycle be if it was to become established in this country? How long would the sort of the life cycle be in this country, um, taking our climate into account? Well, I think it's, you're going to see a, a sort of elongation of the life cycle, similar to what you see with. Um, Asian longhorn beetle in its native range. Um, I think the life uh, the lifespan is sort of two to three or two to four years. Um, and definitely over here, where the temperatures are certainly cooler, you're likely to see the lifespan extend to the latter end of that range. You know, three to four years and possibly longer. And that's exactly what you see with um, Asian longhorn beetle. In that its lifespan is probably one to two years within its native range in China, and over here it's more two to three years. There's definitely an elongation by a year or so, just because of the cooler temperatures. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, I think we're, we're ready to move on to the brown spruce longhorn beetle now. So if that's okay with you, we'll just um, move along with that one. Okay. Okay, the next part of the presentation is on Tetroprium fuscum, commonly called the brown spruce longhorn. The beetle is about 8 to 17 millimetres long, so it's a little bit shorter than something like Asian longhorn beetle, which is 20 to 40 millimetres. Again, it's in the same family. It's a cerambicid, so it's a, a longhorn and will have a very similar life cycle to those of the redneck longhorn and indeed Asian longhorn. So the larvae, again, will develop in the wood, and this is where the damage is done, uh, and it can girdle the trees. So the host are primarily Picea, the spruces, and Pinus, the pines. And on the, with uh, regard to the spruces, uh, we're probably more concerned about Norway spruce and Sitka spruce in the UK. Uh, it has been found on utilizing other hosts, such as the larches and firs. In its native range, so Europe and Northern Asia, it's a secondary pest of coniferous trees. So that means that a primary agent would have had to weaken the tree in the first place for it to really take hold in a tree. And the primary agent can obviously be a pathogen or, or some sort of root disturbance or, or, or tree stress generally. The species in Europe, there are reports of it that it can occur in, in higher numbers in certain years. And there have been small attacks on living trees, uh, which sort of devalues the timber uh, and reducing the quality of it. So back in 1999, uh, there were reports of Tetroprium fuscum apparently attacking healthy trees in Canada. 
And the, uh, the tree species it was attacking was Picea rubens, red spruce. And the Canadians subsequently gave the brown spruce longhorn quarantine status and have established that they think the beetle was introduced probably around 1990, or at least present since then. The highest risk or pathway for introduction is, again, like the other longhorn beetles we've discussed, uh, shipments of wood or solid wood packaging material. Now, in the UK, it's been identified at several locations in Scotland, both morphologically and molecularly. Uh, it's been trapped using various trapping techniques, but it's also been found uh, in trees. The trees it's been found in, though, had already been significantly weakened and were dying with root pathogen problems. So it's very much acting as a secondary pest. OK, the life cycle then, very similar to the other longhorns we've discussed, normally one generation per year. Eggs are laid in batches under bark scales or in cracks of the host tree. The larvae, after they hatch, will feed in the cambium and start creating galleries. Now, interestingly, older larvae bore into the phloem horizontally for two to four centimeters and then bore vertically for three to four centimeters, forming these distinctive L-shaped galleries you can see in the picture. Mature larvae will pupate at the end of the feeding tunnels. Adults will bore through the trunk outward and emerge through exit holes in the bark that will be visible. And these exit holes are typically four millimeters and are oval. The trees infested with the brown spruce longhorn, especially the ones from Canada, which are present there in the pictures, often have resin bleeds on the bark, which are quite conspicuous and distinctive. Um, there will obviously be yellowing and browning of the needles. Because the brown spruce longhorn is thought really only to be a secondary pest at the moment, the trees will probably have yellowing and browning of needles and indeed stem bleeding from other causes as well as the infestation of the brown spruce beetle. Uh, other symptoms, oval exit holes of around four millimeters, and again, you will see frasp. The actual beetle itself, as you saw at the beginning, is fairly nondescript, just a brown looking beetle, and they are difficult to tell apart from other tetropium beetles, such as tetropium castaneum, which we also have in the UK. So other causes of resinosis on stem bleeding can be dendroctinus micans, which you've already heard about. So that's the great spruce bark beetle. And the pictures there on the right-hand side show resin tubes, which are formed as a result of the female bark beetle entering the bark. And they're quite a distinctive and, and a, a good all-round diagnostic aid uh, as regards to Dendroctus mycans. Similarly, uh, just natural stress such as drought can actually cause quite a lot of stem bleeding in spruce. I think ultimately any unexplained dieback of spruce and or any unusual resin uh, with coarse sawdust material and you have also the small exit holes or just generally anything unusual that you can't confidently diagnose. Uh, just obviously send in a tree alert inquiry and we can look into it. So in summary, uh, the brown spruce longhorn Beetle is a secondary pest, primarily of spruce and pine. It originates from Europe and Northern Asia. It has been confirmed in the UK, but only acting at the moment as a secondary pest. There have been reports of it acting as a primary pest uh, in red spruce, 
in Canada. The larval stage, again, is the destructive stage, and this is where most of the damage will occur. It's difficult to identify the beetle as it's fairly nondescript and similar to, to others, for example, Tetropium castaneum. However, the symptoms of the, and damage are quite conspicuous. So you will see exit holes around about four millimeters uh, the fat will be present, and you'll probably find it on stressed and dying spruce as a secondary pest. Okay, so is there anything you'd like to add to that at all? Only that the other stress factors that might influence uh, atropium is obviously green spruce aphid, which is probably the primary pest of Sitka spruce and Norway spruce. So in years where you have high populations of Alatobium, you're likely to get more stressed trees, and that might lead to um, uh, higher numbers of Tetropium and, and other bark beetles and uh, longhorn beetles. So. Okay. And so I don't think it's a pest, a pest of our sort of living healthy spruce, then. It's more a secondary pest. Yeah, well, I wouldn't class it as a primary, primary pest at all. It is just one that's going to come in following other biotic and abiotic factors. Right, okay. And it's fairly widespread, isn't it, around Europe at the moment? It's pretty much uh, across Central and nor Northern Europe and has been for a long time and obviously utilised is Norway spruce being uh, uh, the uh, native species across Europe. Um, I guess the only concern from our point of view was that uh, it was found on red spruce in Canada, which is a North American species, and we have large areas of Sitka spruce, which obviously is also a North American tree species. So I'd I think the concern is probably from that angle rather than it probably ending up being a primary primary pest. Mm, okay, that's great. Are there any um, questions at all for Dave? So, just a question on that. So, we're only worried that it's going to affect um, Sitka spruce as a primary uh, primary primary pest. If it doesn't do that, then it's not a real problem. Is that is that correct? Well, I I debate whether it is going to be a primary pest at all. Um, I think the concern from FC Scotland's point of view is that they've now intercepted uh, uh, Petropium puscum, um, and their concern is obviously in, in Canada it was affecting red spruce. Uh, so they, I think they just want to monitor and be aware of it being, being here and see how it develops over the coming years, you know, in terms of uh, changing climates and things like that. To my... To my uh, thinking it's not going to become a primary pest here, I don't think. Great, thanks. Does it have the same um, breeding cycle in terms of being a roughly 30 centimetres above the soil? Is that where one would look for it, like the other beetles? Well, that's a good question, actually. I would imagine that it's probably higher up on the, on the main trunk. Um, I don't think there's a massive amount of information as to where it attacks on a tree, to be honest with you. Okay. I, I, I would be looking further up the tree than 30 centimetres from the base. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Right, okay. Any, any more questions today before we wind up? Um, no, thanks. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay, great. So once again, then, this webinar will be on the observatory website, with probably within 10 days, something like that. Um, so if you do want to go back and have another listen or another look or um, anything like that, then just that's when it will be available. And so thanks very much for dialing in. Um, this is the last one of the year, um, and I expect there will be some more next year. <laughs>